Well, why free markets? If not free, what are the alternatives? Which market systems yield the greatest good for the greatest number versus though that, those that further human suffering and human poverty? My purpose today is to offer evidence sufficient to prove that the free market alternative is the best choice to foster and support liberty, prosperity, education, advances in human development and human rights, economic growth and development, advances in technology, medicine, and innovation. Freer markets lead to reduced poverty and unemployment, HIV, AIDS, and other related deaths. Freer markets bring about higher literacy, human dignity, and life expectancy rates. With no exception in written history, no empirical to prove other, um, evidence to prove otherwise, the freer the market, the more likely it is to bring about the greater good for the greater number. Freer markets equal greater liberty. Free markets. Free markets. Synonyms for the word free in this instance are words such as boundless, limitless, emancipated, uninhibited, or liberated. The term market in this context is often less understood. A market is simply a physical or virtual place for transactions. It may be a marketplace, a stock exchange, a banking transaction, international trade, or a garage sale. Important here is to emphasize that a free market is also free of corruption, prohibitive taxation, and undue regulation. Let us now understand what foundations encourage a free market. Elemental to this discussion is the system of government on top of which the economic system is shaped. Liberty, the degree of personal and societal liberties, rests atop the economic system foundation as a question mark. The framers of the American Constitution require liberty as the end result for the people of this new nation. Liberty was the vision that shaped our Constitution's framing. Government is a required element of society as the agent to create and uphold liberty and justice for all. Because men are not angels and because God gave man dominion, governments must seek justice. James Madison called government the greatest of all reflections on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary, said James Madison. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the greatest difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and then in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Why, even Billy Graham says that every one of us has a little bit of Watergate in him. Government is required as an agent to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Governments are to seek and oversee justice. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. When the sentence for a crime is not carried out quickly, the hearts of people are filled with schemes to do more wrong. Governments uphold justice. They capture the thief and require that he makes restitution double. They reward obedience and punish disobedience. Governments help us to define our rights. God says we are to subdue the earth and have, and have dominion over his creation. And being created in the image of God implies that humans are rational, responsible, intelligent beings able to pursue our own volition. And then came the fall. The fall established scarcity. The fall set a precedence for human power over choice and free will, over decision making. Economics is the study of scarcity and choice. It is through the lens of economics that we will view the results of government systems, justice, equity, prosperity, and poverty. Lastly, government helps to defend our rights against excess power, against the tyrant. Quoting James Madison again, where an excess of power prevails, property of no sort is duly respected. No man is safe in his opinion, his person, or his faculties, or his possessions. And Voltaire, so long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, 
those who wish to tyrannize will do so. For tyrants are active and ardent. They will devote themselves to any number of gods, religious or otherwise, to put shackles on sleeping men. Government is necessary to manage human nature because men are not angels and we all have a little bit of Watergate in us. However, God gave us dominion and needs, reason and ambition, and provided for property, for ownership, and transaction. Therefore, governments must seek justice, uphold the law, protect our rights, punish the wrongdoer, commend those who do, do good, and by doing so, governments promote liberty by balancing freedoms with justice. Now let's talk about the foundations for economic systems. Once a government is in place, decisions on the degree of control it will have on the economy dictate the type of economic system it will run. No evidence exists of any economic system in the world void of controls of degree of some time, of some degree. Nor do very many people believe that an economy or a society can exist void of some degree of governmental intervention for the reasons I have already stated and many more. The question rather is a matter of degree. The degree of governmental interference for who makes what for whom. Are those decisions controlled or do they come about spontaneously due to market forces and liberty for persons to pursue their own self-interest and their own volition? Does government centralize the decisions surrounding purchase, sale, allocation of goods and services, ideas and knowledge? How much are production, <coughs> policy, pricing, property rights and um, pricing regulated? Is business and property ownership allowed? Are owners allowed to decide what quantity and quality they will produce and at what price they will sell their goods? Or are those decisions dictated by a committee, a committee of regulators who are not angels and who all have a little bit of Watergate in them? The regulators who are paid whether or not businesses or the economy prosper, the regulators who are paid whether or not it is prosperity or poverty on the rise. Governments also set the level, degree, percentage, fairness, and equitability of taxation. Economic systems are a matter of degree of the government interference, and they are labeled by the United Nations, the United Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and research foundations that study them from not free to free. In order from the least free, we have a command economy, a planned economy, a socialist economy, a welfare state, a mixed economy, a market economy, and a free market. Again, the degree of governmental control dictates the economic system in place. Of the governmental restrictions that you see, the value or issue of regulation is that which is questioned most and understood the least. It is a complicated equation, but the results are simple. The results are always the same. Regulation always increases costs. Regulation always decreases efficiency. The question becomes regulation at what cost? Policymakers weigh the costs and benefits of regulation against the three economic measures of efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. And is that not a sound method of deciding stewardship? Is that not a sound method for deciding stewardship? Are we not called to do our best to return to our creator the most we are able to while respecting our gifts, our talents, and others? Is that not the lesson of the parable of the talents? At the start of the 20th century, taxation of the American worker totaled about 14%, and government had barely begun to regulate. Regulations are funded by taxes. They're funded by your taxes. They come at a cost to every American. Regardless how far removed it you are from the tobacco industry regulation, from union labor, from greenhouse gases, or from the level of chlorine in the pub public swimming pool, every American pays for regulation through their paycheck, property taxes, sales taxes, import fees, or a hundred other forms of taxation that when added up equal over 43% of the earnings of each of you. Regulation always increases costs and always decreases efficiency. It stamps out initiative for innovation. 
Before the airline industry was deregulated, only the rich could fly. Once deregulated, Southwest Airlines was born, and now we are free to, free to move about the country <laughs> and the world. Once the telecom industry was deregulated, technology already through, used, in use throughout Europe was put together and used in America, and the long distance rates plummeted. In 1988, I paid on average of $250 a month to call home and friends around the country. In today's dollars, that's about $400 a month. This summer, the, com the cable company began to offer unlimited long distance anywhere in the United States, any time of the day, for $32 a month. Well, why so cheap? Because my computer connection allows free phone calls anywhere in the world with a video connection to boot. And as you will see, at the start of the worldwide deregulation, yeah, that coincides with an increase in world prosperity and a decrease in world poverty. The question of liberty, the degree of liberty, is a function of the economic and governmental systems in place. Let's take a moment to understand liberty. If liberty is real, then it must be measurable. So let's measure liberty. Liberty is the quality or state of being free. It's the power to do as one pleases. It's freedom from physical restraint, freedom from arbitrary or despotic control, it's positive enjoyment of various social, political, economic, and, and privileges. It's the power of choice. We measure liberty by measuring governance and economic freedom. Governance is a relatively new word used now by the UN and the IMF, the World Bank, and scholars to account for the method of government or a manner of governing. By 1996, it became common practice to measure governance by these six factors. Democratic voting, political stability, absence of violence, governmental effectiveness, the rule of law, and control of corruption. On a scale of zero to 10, a low rank is ineffective and a high rank is effective governance. The adjectives used to describe regimes with low rankings, are suppress, repress, captivity, dependence, limits, constraints, and subjugate. The adjectives associated with good governance are liberty, freedom, emancipate, independence, choice, free will, and sovereignty. Economic freedom is measured in the same fashion. The categories measured are financial freedom, one's ability to own their own business, to trade their own money, and to invest their own money. It's rights, one's ability to decide where to work, when to play, and whether to own property. It's freedom from government interference through taxation, unwise spending, price controls, and the setting of limits high or low on your wages. It's the freedom from corruption, bribes, extortion, and black markets. Again, economic freedom is on a scale from zero to 10. With governance as its foundation, economic freedoms teeter tenuously on the shifting fulcrum of changing governmental regimes. Modern economic systems are a product of degree of freedom from governmental control, of interference in the spontaneous workings of the market, where billions of people making trillions of transactions are every day. Vivid are the results of the past and current economic freedoms today. Is there any question in your mind which countries are going to occupy the worst freedom? North Koreans are less than 3% free to prosper. In the, 19, uh, in the 2008 rankings, the bottom six countries are Cuba, Libya, Zimbabwe, Burma, Turkmenistan, and the Congo. The top rankings are Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, the US, New Zealand, UK, and Ireland, none of which are greater than 90% free. There's a natural break point at about the 90% free economic level where governments do not dare to tread because men are not angels and because of human nature. It is human nature, not regulation, that drives laws of supply and demand. It is consumer sovereignty the idea that you know best what is best for you, your family, your children, your business, and your life. 
that drives prices towards the lowest possible equilibrium and forces businesses to compete, to innovate, to drive efficiency into their productivity. Left alone, markets will find their own equilibrium, even in an imperfect economy. Now let's look at some of the results of free markets over time and around the world. The 2007 gross domestic product in the United States was just over $13 trillion, and our population was just over 300 million. If you put that equation together, you get a per capita income of a little over $43,000 a year. That means $43,000 a year for each one of you, each one of your children, each one of your grandchildren, each one of your grandparents. This figure is used to compare relative wealth of countries around the world. Economic freedom dictates prosperity and poverty, and let's just look at this same list of countries and their per capita income. As you can see, the high-ranking countries have somewhere in the thirty dollars to $40,000 a year to spend per person. The lower-ranking countries are near 1000 Some facts about which you might be wondering, which is the wealthiest and which is the poorest country? Luxembourg and Somalia. I think I'll move to Luxembourg. Our neighbors to the north are far greater faring than our neighbors to the south, a product of the economic and governmental system. Now let's add North and South Korea. The difference is shocking. $1,800 to $24,000 difference. 3% free, 67% free. The shocking difference is a result only of the economic and governmental systems. We can't blame that on a tsunami. We can't blame it on climate. We can only blame that on the governmental system and the economic system in place. Now let's compare China and Zimbabwe. China has moved from a strict com communist regime towards a freer market. Private property, commercial enterprise, production and trade, through re though, though regulated, are now allowed in urban areas in China. War-torn Africa has not secured property rights for individuals, and their ability to produce beyond meeting their daily food needs is rarely met. There is nothing left to trade. Let's look at the indices. China's GDP per capita is on the rise at 7,800. Unemployment is 4.2% where the new rules are in place and still a staggering 80% in the rural areas. Their growth rate is 11.1% and there is no reason in sight for this growth to slow. As a matter of fact, it will probably increase. Zimbabwe's GDP per capita is falling. It's at 2,800, 80% unemployment, a negative growth rate of 4.6% and Zimbabwe's economy is crashing. In 1820, 80% of the world population lived in what we now consider poverty. At the turn of the century, less than 20% of the people in the world lived in poverty. From 1820 to 1960, the number of people living on the equivalent of $1 a day rose. As the leading economies began to deregulate their markets, as socialism and communism began to falter, these numbers began to decrease. As Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan began to privatize their respective economies and others followed, poverty declined faster. At the end of the Cold War and until today, as more governments embrace fear markets, poverty continues to decline. Today, fewer people as a percentage of the total population live in desperate poverty than have ever before. With no exception, with no exception, economic freedom predicts per capita income. There are some outliers on the high side and good for them. With no exception, economic freedom predicts access to banking, health care, clean water, transportation, markets, and education. With no exception, GDP per capita predicts human development, mortality rates, literacy rates. There are some outliers on the high side and good for them. Markets, free markets, were popularized by the Turgot-Smith duo in the 18th century. They became acquainted while studying for the ministry. Studying at the best schools of their time, separately and together, they developed the theory of the invisible hand, which states, and I quote, each man acting in his own self-interest inadvertently acts in the best interest of all, end quote.
Each man protecting his own self-interest protects that of his family, his friends, his sphere of influence, and creates a self-policing society, a free market society. For example, if I am going to buy a roast from you, Kevin, and it's rotten, how long are you going to stay in business in my town? Not very long. Is it in your best interest to treat me fairly and the customers that come to you fairly? Absolutely. Of course it is. As if, as if an invisible hand directs us towards fair dealing, markets free of outside manipulation to the de greatest degree that is still wise and to the greatest degree possible will work the best. In earlier works, the invisible hand was the invisible hand of God. Smith's theory of enlightened self-interest is a product of his keen understanding of the great philosophers Plato and Socrates, his theology and his economics. It is the invisible hand of God that directs us to act in our own best interest and in the best interest of all. Good governance, economic freedom, religious freedom, human rights, human development, and liberty all fall on the free side of the economic spectrum with no empirical data showing otherwise. Liberty is the product of good governance and economic freedom. Hayek, the Nobel laureate in economics and designer of Thatcher era, era de deregulation plan put it this way, markets work best, why mess with anything else? The role of the entrepreneur is very key in free markets, but better than I to talk about the entrepreneur is Dr. Melanie Day, who got her dissertation in entrepreneurship. Here's Dr. Melanie Day. Yes, yeah, so thank you. That was wonderful. And I'm so blessed to be here to talk about entrepreneurship, um, an area that's so near and dear to my heart. I'm a believer. <laughs> and um, I'm going to talk fast because I have a lot of meat here and not a lot of time. So bear with me if. Um, if I don't take too many breaths in between, you know, come along for the ride with me. So how do free markets relate to entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is a process that relies on an individual or group of individuals to make it happen. Their individuals like you and I are made in the image of God. I might say uh, God is the most imaginative, the most creative, the most productive inventor or entrepreneur of all time. Since we were created by God and in his image, it is no wonder that most, if not all of us, feel compelled to create in some way. The entrepreneur puts his creative uh, nature to task by bringing goods and services into existence when no actual current market exists for them. A free market economy is the most fertile environment for entrepreneurship. It's not too bold of a statement to say that under God, entrepreneurship is responsible for the creation of every single innovation, every invention, every technology that mankind has put into use. The very chair you're sitting on, the pen and paper you write with, your clothing, your house, your computer, and cell phone, none of these things existed at some point. There had to be, not necessarily in this order, a conducive environment, both social and economic, opportunity recognition, idea formation, the willingness to take the risk, a mobilization of resources, human capital material, and a successful implementation among myriad unsuccessful implementations for every single good or service that people can own, trade, or sell in today's world. The term entrepreneur was first used by J.B. Say, the French economist, around 1800. The entrepreneur was one who shifted economic resources out of an area of lower productivity and yield into a higher one. The German term is Unternehmer, some of you German students, which directly translated means undertaker, but that doesn't work so well for us in English. But the term entrepreneur refers to one who takes up the challenge to bring a new product or service into existence, is able to convince others that it can be done, and can corral the resources necessary despite the fact that there is no guarantee that there will ever be a market. Entrepreneurship. Uh, research and historical evidence has shown us that where this activity occurs in abundance, where it is valued and promoted, economies are stronger and healthier, more jobs are created, and more wealth is more efficiently distributed across more populations than with any other economic system in history, and quite probably world history, although we don't have the research to back that up yet. <laughs> but entrepreneurs existed long before they were recognized as such. Consider the following fathers and mothers of these technologies. In Genesis, Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. 
Zilla also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Imagine the creation of the first tent, probably using animal skins, or coming up with the idea of keeping herds of sheep and goats rather than hunting them in the wild. Imagine Duval's thought process as he found that dried sheep intestine could be formed into strings and stretched across a curve of wood to make a harp. And that if you blew through just the right kind of hollow branch with holes down the side, beautiful sounds could be made. Imagine the first songs. Imagine his brothers accusing him of sitting around and wasting time. <laughs> I would venture that Jabal traded tent-making technology and livestock with Jabal for music lessons for his family to worship, and Jabal Cain for tools of bronze and iron to assist in making better tents and instruments and food. Those were truly days of limited government. In modern times, boundaries are drawn, and while there are always ongoing changes in the world, Entrepreneurship happens within given social political economies, as we've seen. And entrepreneurs find themselves creating opportunities or trying despite the constraints and with the resources that are available to them. Borrowing from a rich history, the Acton Institute in its core value statement lays out two truths that are fundamental to this topic of free markets and entrepreneurship and how they relate to the responsibility of the, pre the believer integrating Judeo-Christian truth with free market principles. The first is economic liberty and the second is creation of wealth. And we've seen some of that already, but let me, let me just read this to you. Liberty, in a positive sense, is achieved by fulfilling one's nature as a person by freely choosing to do what one ought. Economic liberty derives from this in freely choosing to do what one ought as applies to the economic realm. As such, the bearer of economic liberty not only has certain rights but also duties. An economically free person, for example, must be free to enter the market voluntarily. Hence, those who have the power to interfere with the market are duty-bound to remove any artificial barrier to entry in the market and also to pr protect private and shared property rights. But the economically free person will also bear the duty to others to participate in the market as a moral agent and in accordance with moral goods. Therefore, the law must guarantee private property rights and voluntary exchange, as we've seen earlier. Moving on to creation of wealth. Material impoverishment undermines the conditions that allow humans to flourish. The best means of reducing poverty is to protect private property rights through the rule of law. This allows people to enter into voluntary exchange circles in which to express their creative nature. Wealth is created when human beings creatively transform matter into resources. Because human beings can create wealth, economic exchange need not be a zero-sum game. And let me reread that statement. Wealth is created when human beings creatively transform matter into resources. When the entrepreneur applies this attribute of the image of God, creativity, to transforming matters into resources, wealth can be created and exchange can occur, lifting the quality of life for all involved. This is not to say that all entrepreneurs act altruistically or for noble purposes. More often, an entrepreneur's dream is to be rich. But in this process, as we've seen, again, this, is, this, is, this um, matches so well with what Tamara said. Uh, the process of entrepreneurship, the byproducts of wealth creation and redistribution occur in multiplier effects that reaches far beyond the entrepreneur. Without this foundation, entrepreneurship can turn unproductive, predatory, appropriative, which de-incentivize and demotivate the entrepreneurial activity. In the past, researchers believed that there must be special attributes or traits born to the entrepreneurs, giving them special sight and ability to make all this occur. However, in study after study, academic research has debunked much of the conventional wisdom about entrepreneurs. Research shows no unique characteristics possessed by these drivers of change. There's a myth, myth that entrepreneurs are extreme risk takers, but research has shown that they try to manage and limit risk, even outsourcing it where they can through shared equity, debt, and other insurance models. And there's a myth that entrepreneurs have some sort of secret method that they can apply to venture after venture, but many repeat entrepreneurs fail, even after an initial highly successful venture experience. Research has shown that entrepreneurs fail on average three times before they are successful, actually. Despite this sometimes devastating downside, Repeated entrepreneurial activity has indeed proven to create wealth and improve quality of life. In a free market society, the entrepreneur is generally recognized as a driver and engine of technology advances that improve the quality of life and create and distribute wealth. 
In organizational ecology corners, entrepreneurship is considered a repeated statistical onslaught. Some of it will stick and be successful, and others will not, you know, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, this dynamic force also drives the creative destruction of global capitalism. You've probably heard that. Joseph Schumpeter. History is filled with industries that have passed away as new ones took their place. People are hurt. Livelihoods are lost. The stakeholders in dying industries are frequently bolstered by government subsidies and trade protections and fight long and hard to hang on until their demise is inevitable. However, disruptive technologies enable startups to jump into large lucrative markets where established leaders have become complacent. Because of the process of entrepreneurship, you and I are able to do much of our research simply sitting at our computers and accessing the world. I'm glad to be able to do research today, in this day and age. Databases of information are available to us at a touch of a button, including those found through our own CCU library. A perfect source, Google, Wikipedia, all of those. I'm sure you are familiar with, uh, with uh, Wikipedia, the online open source encyclopedia. Um, that's a replaced, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and driving it into a new way of business, actually, because it is online now. Um, I used uh, Wikipedia to find some background on Anne Rand for this presentation. You may be familiar with Anne Rand's writings. She was a Russian-born American novelist, born in 1905 and died in 1982. She wrote The Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged. But this, from Capitalism, The Unknown Deal, she writes, America's abundance was created not by public sacrifices to the common good, but by the productive genius of free men who pursued their own personal interests and the making of their own private fortunes. They did not starve people to pay for America's industrialization. They gave the people better jobs, higher wages, and cheaper goods with every new machine they invented, with every scientific discovery or technological advance. And thus, the whole country was moving forward and profiting, not suffering every step of the way. But because of this making of their own private fortunes, and because of this inevitable change and disruption, disruption to lives, entrepreneurs have been framed as pigs and other myriad other, uh, negative objectives. As was pointed out in the strategic objective on Western civilization, an opposing social and political economy was created that sought to eliminate the rich entrepreneur capitalist pig in order to lift the lowly and attempt to create equality and distribute wealth. This turned into a major experiment of nations in the 19th and 20th centuries and continues even today. Um, think about uh, San Jose and, and versus Detroit, you know, what's going on if, you're, if you've been reading in the news. The issues of private ownership, welfare, social justice, social justice government, responsibility versus uh, personal responsibility, among others, are all pieces of this puzzle, too much to go into here. But to paraphrase Winston Churchill, Capitalism is the worst system there is, except for all the others. You've heard that one. <laughs> Many would-be entrepreneurs have sought to make their fortunes by discovering or creating opportunities that others have missed. There's also another significant motivator for entrepreneurship, that's necessity, where all other options for work are either unavailable or un unsatisfactory. Uh, Necessity drives many more down the route of entrepreneurship. Consider the employee from a large organization that may have toyed with the idea to start his own business. He receives a layoff, no layoff notice and decides, now is the time. Another entrepreneur of necessity might come to the U.S. as a refugee, fleeing from religious or political persecution. Possessing a college education and years of experience in her own country, she can only find jobs that would have her cleaning toilets and changing beds. She saves every extra bit of income she can and eventually is able to start small business. Over time, she starts another one and another one, eventually providing employment for many. In the United States, the majority of employees work for small to mid-sized companies. Many of those are new entrepreneurial ventures. Entrepreneurial ventures also include corporate venturing or entrepreneurship, as it's known, entrepreneurship that occurs within established organizations. For our purposes, all of these forms of entrepreneurship can be creators of wealth in a free market. A country's gross domestic product, as we've seen again, per capita is considered a measure of relative wealth of a nation when compared to other nations. We've seen that entrepreneurship is a driver of wealth creation and that creation of wealth lifts poverty and improves life. So it is interesting to study a country's entrepreneurial activity together with the level of economic development, GDP, and related socioeconomic factors to assess world trends. At a recent international session on entrepreneurship I attended, the dean from a pro prominent business school in Beijing was speaking about entrepreneurship in China. One thing he said particularly stood out, that the higher the ratio of government employees to non-government employees, the lower will be the GDP for that country. The more government employees there are, the less there are to be productive in society and contribute towards that country's GDP. 
The Global Entrepreneurship Monitor was initiated in 1999 as a partnership between the London Business School and the Babson College in Massachusetts. Both institutions are well known for their work in entrepreneurship. The research program involves exploration of the role of entrepreneurship in national economic growth. In 2006, the GEM assessed the entrepreneurial activity of 42 participant countries. This 2006 report noted that as high as 10% of the population in the United States is participating in some type of early stage entrepreneurial activity, either planning or having just started a new venture. That's about 30 million people in the U.S. Another 14 of the 42 countries in the analysis also have over 10% of their population initiating ventures. Two notables, Peru, with over 40% of its population, or roughly 11.5 million people, and China, with over 16.2% of its population, or 214 million people, are engaging in entrepreneurial activity as measured by the study. By contrast, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom now uh, are, um, show 4.2%, 4.4%, and 5.8% respectively for their populations. The GEM report continues acknowledging that the rate of aggregate entrepreneurial activity also depends on the demographic, cultural, and institutional characteristics of each country. Regardless of the level of development and firm size, entrepreneurial behavior remains a crucial engine of innovation and growth for the economy. And for individual companies, since by definition, it implies attention and willingness to take advantage of unexploited opportunities. Jesus uses the parable of the steward in Luke 16. Uh, he tells his followers to be shrewd and wise in dealing with the ways and tools and systems of this world, including money. James warns believers to use right motives when we act in the world. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. James, he, he, can, he also writes, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I don't know that poverty can ever totally be eradicated. Jesus said that the poor will always be with us. What I do know is that where free markets can take hold, the God-created nature of human beings will find them creatively transforming matter into resources for exchange, creating wealth. We happen to call the person driving this process an entrepreneur. In re recent words of a Chinese economics professor, where there is more entrepreneurship, there is more equality. Where there is less entrepreneurship, there is more inequality. Even China is slowly realizing that entrepreneurship and free markets are solutions, if not the solution, to their growing poverty gap. The same applies in the United States, as we've seen. For us at CCU, this process of wealth, cre wealth creation is not an end, but a tool that we have as stewards to use wisely, as Jesus said. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. A free market provides the entrepreneur the greatest ability, opportunity, and responsibility as a bearer of economic liberty to fulfill this amazing potential and apply this God-created, um, God-given creativity. The believing entrepreneur can use all this to the glory of God and to advance his kingdom. Now I have the honor to introduce Dr. Sid Buzzell. He's going to be talking about whether um, free markets violate or integrate with scripture. As a long-term pastor, I know what it's like to be the last one up. <laughs> so I uh, gave you most of what I would say on, on a handout for you to do further work. I'm assuming literacy in this group, so I think that's fairly safe. When Bill asked me to speak to this subject, I said, you're joking, right? I mean, I, uh, first of all, I'm not an economist or a business type person. Secondly, asking the Bible to speak to free markets is like using your motorcycle manual to fix your washing machine. That's not what it was written for. And he said, no, I, I, I understand that. But there are some concerns and some questions about free markets that come from Christians. And although it is empirically and practically evident and obvious from our terrific presentations here that free markets are superior to any other market. The final question is, does it violate scripture? As Colorado Christian University, that is the final question for us on any matter. So Bill and I 
visited and, and uh, sort of boil it down to three questions, uh, pardon me, three concerns and a couple of questions which I have tried to address from the scriptures. And the first concern that Bill uh, asked me to speak to is this concern, do free markets contribute to inequality among people? Answer, yeah, yeah. So the next question is, is that wrong? Is inequality wrong? Well, first of all, we look from this chart that I found from the uh, Census uh, Bureau that there is a distribution of wealth. Not everybody in the U.S. under a free market economy makes the same amount of money. And you can see all the way from less than $10,000 to over $200,000 across the scale there that, that, that the uh, economy is distributed uh, differently among different people. However, in a control economy, we don't see inequality distributed across a spectrum. We see gaps. A very few people, those in charge, have great amounts of money, while the vast majority who are not in charge live in abject poverty. Controlled economies don't show a distribution of income, but a, back, uh, a gap in income. And inequality is a fact of life in any economy. It's, it's just a way of life. It's a fact of life. In fact, under the ideal economy we're looking at in the scriptures, uh, under the Old Testament where God did legislate with law how people were to live their lives, he never gave them specifics about how to use their economy. What he did do is distribute the land of Canaan among the different tribes and among the different families. Was that an equal distribution? No way. One person had a lovely piece of flat land with water running through it in a great climate. Another person got a piece of land on the side of a hill where he had to terrace it and, and the, the temperatures were different, the water availability was different. So it was an equitable distribution of land, but certainly not an equal distribution of land. A man working that better piece of land over time would be able to generate greater income than someone who had to work on a hard scrabble piece of land. So those inequalities tended to grow. And that's why God said, I'm building into my economy not a control to keep everything equal, but I command equity. God said, I don't want this economy to operate in a way where a few of you live lavish lives while others have to go without. So if you look at point B, uh, number three, wealth and poverty is a reality of life and neither is praised nor condemned by God. He doesn't reject the poor. He doesn't scold the poor. He doesn't rail against the rich. Inequality is a fact of life. But God said, I do want equity. Point C, God never promised equality, but he demanded equity. And if you look at the Mosaic laws that regulate equity, you see the sabbatical year where every seventh year debts were canceled, indentured people were released. Every 50th year, land, which was the, the source of revenue, the way people made their living, all went back to the original families. And selling and buying of land was regulated by how close we were, they were to a jubilee year because you had to give it back on the year of jubilee. God established judges throughout the land to ensure justice and to regulate these laws. We have the Leverett laws, which said a family whose, whose uh, father died, whose husband died, uh, would not lose their land because a near kinsman, a relative, had to raise up children to keep property in that family. The laws of gleaning said to people, there is a way for you to survive even if you fall on hard times. The, the, uh, the, the command against usury 
said you can't take advantage of somebody who has fallen on hard times. So the whole Levitical law is sprinkled throughout with regulations that, that keep equity without demanding equality. Secondly, under this point of God never promised equality but demanded equity is the fact that Israel's destruction by the Assyrians and the Babylonians was connected to ignoring these laws of regulating inequity. When you read the 8th century prophets who railed against Israel and against Judah for violating God's laws, it's kind of surprising what they were railing against. What God had as a beef against his people. Why did God allow the Assyrians to destroy Israel and the Babylonians to destroy Judah? Well, he said, God said this in Isaiah. It's just startling. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. I hate your new moon festivals. I hate your appointed feasts. Even though you multiply prayers, I won't listen. Why? What ticked God off? To this extent that he said, I don't even want your worship. The highest thing that a human can do is worship God. And God said, I detest it. Why? Look at the bottom line. He said, you want to get right with me? Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Hosea says, does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What does God want from me? These high acts of worship? No. He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. God said the way we keep equity in the land is that those of you who have provide for those who do not have. And when you don't, I don't even want to hear you worship. Abraham Heschel put this concern very well. He said, we can never sing our worship songs loudly enough into God's ears to drown out the cries of the poor and the oppressed whom we ignore. Pretty startling stuff. God said, I'm not going to control the economy. I want you to do that. I'm not going to make everything equal. That's impossible in the real world. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 tells us when the Son of Man comes in his glory and separates the sheep from the goats in the final judgment, he's going to put the sheep on his right. And the sheep will say, how did we get here? Why do we get this? The king will say to those on his right, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. In other words, you took care of me. And they said, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you without clothes? The king said, in that you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Very troubling passage in the final judgment. God says, I separate the sheep and the goats on the basis of how you used the poor. How you worked to establish equity among my people. God's answer to inequity was not a controlled economy, but it was generosity, justice, warnings against greed. And that's the second concern that Bill asked me to address, free markets appeal to human greed. Well, greed is not the product of, nor unique to, any market system. It's a fact of fallen humanity. The problem of greed, therefore, will not be solved by any market system. God went beyond condemning greed and commanded 
generosity. He also commended it in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, but you can see how seriously God took this business of generously taking care of those who cannot take care of themselves. A third concern was free markets foster a me first attitude. Uh, point number three, Jesus commanded us to love our neighbors and free markets foster a me first attitude. Very simple answer, free markets do not foster a me first attitude. I don't need any kind of a market to turn me into a self-serving, greedy creep. And don't look so pious, you don't either. <laughs> to blame that on free markets is crazy. In fact, I put the de definition of free markets. This is having this, nothing to do with self-seeking. The Christian's response to Jesus' command to love neighbor and self is to seek a lifestyle that allows the greatest freedom to pursue prosperity as biblically defined for neighbor as well as self. Two, qu two questions about the integration of free markets and scripture. As stewards of what God owns, what system allows the greatest return on his resources? We own nothing. We own nothing. Notice in the parable of the stewards, which both previous speakers addressed. In Matthew 25, Jesus told that parable about the man who went away. The kingdom of God is like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Now, if you start in Matthew 24, you see Matthew puts into the mouth of Jesus' disciples, increasingly this question of, you're going away, but when are you coming back? We won't, when are you coming back? And Jesus said, wrong question. I ain't going to tell you. You guys are focusing on when I'm coming back. I want you to focus on what you're supposed to do in the meantime. I'm going to surprise you. In fact, the kingdom of God is like if a man went away on a journey, called in his servants, and gave them his possessions for them to manage as stewards while he was away. And then the parable goes on. When the man came back, he called his stewards in, one at a time. And he said, what happened with that money I placed in your care? Each one of them gave an account. If you remember, the third one said, I really didn't do anything with it. And he was severely punished. Why was he severely punished? Look at the last verse 27. What the man said when he came back to the servant who didn't use his resources well, you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. You and I own nothing. God owns it all. I never have to justify what I give. I always have to justify what I keep for myself. So the question is, as a good steward of money that God has placed in my care to use to build his kingdom, what system best allows me to be an entrepreneur? best allows me to multiply those funds to invest in God's kingdom and to take care of the poor? We've seen the answer very well presented today. Finally, as humans created with freedom, capacity, and responsibility of choice, what system best allows us to thrive as fully functioning human beings uh, who are citizens of God's kingdom? We serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If anybody is in control, it's God. And your students ask me all the time, and I suspect they ask you, how do you know God's will? Why is that a mystery? Because God says, I'm not going to legislate every minute aspect of your life. I've given you a moral will. But in large areas of your life, even when you ask me and you want me to legislate and you want me to control your life, I refuse to do it. So as people created with free, responsible will, we don't have free will, we have responsible will. 
What system of government allows me to function in the way God created me? Controlled economies or free markets? I have given a few conclusions here which you can look at. I just want to focus just for a second on points six and seven. The Bible neither supports nor condemns any market system. At this time, free markets, as defined, appear to most integrate with and to least violate God's revealed will for his people. That does not baptize it as a system. It only commends it as the best option currently available. If a system is created or discovered that better serves the Christian's effort to love God and serve him forever, free markets should be abandoned and that system should be adopted. At this time, that system doesn't exist or we haven't found it. This presentation, and this comes from the mouth of our president, this presentation is not designed to promote free markets per se. Now I'm freestyling here. CCU is not about free markets. It is about total commitment to honor God and pursue his will. As responsible citizens of God's kingdom, we want maximum freedom for God's people to live as God desires, intends, and commands. Hence, I've put a few resources at the bottom for you to uh, do further research. I would like to make a comment at the, the last of those notations. Numerous conversations with informed, helpful, terrific CCU colleagues, especially Frank Ames, Bill Armstrong, Tamara Broad, Gary Ewan, and Chuck King, have been great uh, help. It's an honor to work isn't it great? I like doing this stuff. This is good stuff. Thank you. Free markets are by far the best in producing wealth is so obvious. Why do academicians, people who consider themselves smarter than everyone else, so violently resist the obvious. My answer is I'm not sure that it is so obvious to those of us who have not spent years in this field. Uh, Janet and Bernie have spent years producing good writing and, and reading skills and therefore have probably not spent the time looking at cause and effect of economic systems and government systems. So I'm not sure that what seems so obvious is so obvious. I think that's the best answer. And I believe that introducing the subject of free markets and the wealth that it produces and the fewer uh, degrees of poverty that exist in the wealthier nations, um, this introduction today is just scratches the surface of what myself and many of my colleagues have spent years and years trying to understand. So I would love to believe that it's obvious, but I don't believe it is. Just a, a couple of things to that. It kind of, I, I believe that it depends on what you believe about human nature. I believe that if you feel that human, humans are basically good and mean to do well and given the right environment would make the right choices, you'll form a certain kind of government that reflects that. If you believe that human nature is basically evil, then you're going to form a different kind of government. And I think this is I think this is foundational to, to these, this, this poll that, that Tamara, you saw her slide created you know, from the command economy all the way. I think this is one of the, the key reasons um, groups of people believe, no, we can make wise decisions. We can provide for the people and, and we, um, we can, you know, equal, equality, equity, um, fairness, we, we can make those choices. We can know and others say, no, power corrupts, you know and um, give that power in the, into the hands of a few people and terrible things will happen, so that's... I've got two questions that I'm going to answer at the same time. The first one, deregulation was emphasized and encouraged. What about the mortgage crisis situation that we now have? Is this human nature run amok? Yes. What is the recommendation for current economic crisis in light of the regulators of Ben Bernanke et al. and Congress? Are we just to wait for the free market to correct itself? Yes. And let me, um, let me elaborate. If we, in a hurry, create policy for a short-term problem. Undoing policy 
is almost never done. Once the welfare program was in place, undoing welfare will take, if it ever, ever can happen, uh, will take years and years and years. Once Social Security was instituted, getting out of Social Security is not going to happen. Bureaucracies become self-perpetuating. Their job is to maintain their job. And if we give somebody the opportunity to create policy and have a job to create policy and maintain policy, even if the policy is awful, they are going to do just that. So if we, in a rush, correct something that the market will take care of over time, we will have a worse outcome in the long run, and self-perpetuating bureaucracy is what we will have in the end. Okay, I think I'm, I'm up again. Would regulators such as those regarding child labor uh, institute a response to the Industrial Revolution be considered the 10% of the necessary regulation? If so, what principles are used to differentiate between healthy and unhealthy regulation? It's a great question that I can't answer in one and a half minutes, um, but I would say that the child labor laws, the union labor laws, many of the laws that have now grown into what we know as OSHA and um, other forms of laws the, the 40 hours a week, um, who can get paid for what, overtime, etc. All of those laws are necessary and they grew out of what this person asked as the child labor laws and the union labor laws. The question is, when are we going to do with the, union, with the unions? If we've got all the laws that do what the unions asked us to do, how can we now undo the unions? Which goes back to what I said before. Once you have a self-perpetuating bureaucracy, you can't undo it. Now we have two sets of rules on the books. We've got the rules for child labor and the OSHA and unemployment and all of that. And we've got labor unions and they do the same thing. And each of them have costs and each of them are paid for through your tax dollars, through your paychecks. So the question is, how do we get out of a law? A law? How do we get out of a policy once it's instituted? We've got to be very careful when we're going to institute because the unintended consequences of our instituted policies are years down the low road. Using Turgot and Smith with the invisible hand example, John Nash's model has been completely ignored. Can you speak to free markets in light of Nash's theory? For those of you who don't who know who Nash is, he's the uh, beautiful mind economist. He won the Nobel Prize, and I believe in 1993, uh, for his work mainly in game theory. Game theory um, and Turgot and Smith Turgot and Smith are about uh, free markets. Game theory is a small a small segment of free markets, it's, it's the strategy piece of free markets. And most people don't ever get to think there because they're too busy doing their life. Um, if you spend time, <laughs> If you spend time where I've been spending time, we get to play with game theory. Game theory is often used in the, um, uh, in the oligopolistic uh, marketplace. So unless you hang out in the oligopolistic marketplace, you probably don't hang out in game theory. Um, it's also been called the prisoner's dilemma and many other forms of game theory. So they, they are compatible, but the ga game theory and strategy theory is a very small segment of free markets, but you have to have the free market foundation for the game theory uh, to work. There's your answer. <laughs>